before we start, I, I'd like to take another opportunity just to bow our heads for a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessed privilege of coming to worship you this morning. And Lord, as we do, we invite you to fulfill your promise of joining us wherever two or three are gathered together in your name. And Father, I ask that as we share that I would fade away and that you would bring forth a message that would touch our hearts and draw us unto you. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon each person who is here today and upon myself as well, Lord, that your will may be done. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, as we start today, I would like to go over to John chapter 10 and look at a story about Jesus where he is talking about a particular subject. John chapter 10 and beginning at verse 1, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings them out, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. I heard a story about a man who had gone to the Holy Land on a tour and he was riding on a bus and the bus stopped at a particular location and this man saw a group of sheep and he thought that was neat. I haven't seen a shepherd over in the Holy Land. I wonder what they're like. And as he watched, he saw this shepherd smacking the sheep and pushing them along, trying to force them into this little area. And the man looked and he said, that's not like any of the stories that I've read. And he said, I always heard that the shepherd went ahead and the sheep just followed his voice. And the tour guide looked at him and he said, sir, I'm sorry, that's not the shepherd, that's the butcher. Jesus continued on, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of the stranger. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things he spoke to them. Now, why could the religious leaders not understand the things that Jesus was speaking to them? because he was speaking about spiritual things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Jesus continues in verse 7, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And I will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Now why in the world does Jesus all of a sudden set out with the intent that I'm going to declare to these people that I'm the good shepherd? And there's a reason that's tied up in the context of this chapter. If you look at chapter 9 and chapter 11, they are bookends to help understand why Jesus is talking here 
about being a good shepherd. And I'd like to back up to John chapter 9 and verse 1. It tells a story about a man. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That was a common belief for the Jews at that time, that if a person was born with some kind of infirmity, that there was a sin either by the parents of the child or the child himself somehow did something to deserve what came upon him. I wonder if we have ever been in a situation when we heard that someone had a serious illness and all of a sudden we hear someone else say, did they smoke? Or we hear them say, did they eat these kind of things? Or we say, did they do this that, that brought this illness upon them? That was the attitude of the Pharisees in that time. But pay particular attention to our scripture reading for today. In verse 3, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. In verse 4, he says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said these things, he spat on the ground, made some clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. He sent him to a pool called Siloam, which means sent. And the man went, and he washed his eyes like Jesus told him, and he came back able to see. In verse 8, it says, Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind, they watched him walking by. They said, uh, is this the blind man? Is this, is this the guy that we always saw sitting out there begging, couldn't do anything? Is, is this him? And the other man says, well, he kind of looks a lot like him. He says, no, I am the man. A man called Jesus spat on the ground, made some clay, and put it on my eyes. He sent me to go wash. When I washed my eyes, I could see. They said to him, well, where is he? He says, I don't know. He couldn't see when he left Jesus. He didn't know what happened with Jesus. He just knew that he went and he washed and he could see. In verse 24, it says, they again called the man who was blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know this man's a sinner. And the blind man, all he knows about the man that put the clay on his eyes is that there was some kind of a miracle that happened as a result of what he did. In verse 25, he says, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know, but one thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sin. Are you trying to teach us? These were the religious leaders of the time. And the next portion there it says, and they cast him out. Now this was not just a condition of them saying, go out of here, don't come back to church again. Like you might tell somebody who was disrupting things in the congregation. You might say, you know, either quiet down or you may have to leave here. When a person of their time was excommunicated from the synagogue, it meant that they could not do business with any other Jews and that no other Jews would do business for them. It meant they could neither buy nor sell. It's kind of interesting. In the end times, we hear about a time when people will not be able to buy or sell. 
In this case, the Pharisees were bringing this upon this man because they couldn't accept the fact that Jesus actually could heal him. They were concerned about the implications of believing that. In verse 35, it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. When he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of God? The man said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen who he is, and he's talking to you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus, in verse 39, he said, For judgment I've come into this world that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were there and heard him, they said, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now I say to you, or you, now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. In John chapter 3 and verse 19, Jesus brings out the condition that will call, cause people to be lost or saved. He says, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world but men preferred the darkness because their deeds were evil. These Pharisees had seen a tremendous light in the fact that Jesus could heal the eyes of one who was born blind. And yet they were unwilling to accept that light because the implications were very hard for them to accept. Now, when Jesus started in chapter 10 talking about being the good shepherd, he was not speaking in a vacuum to these Pharisees. In chapter 9 here, this man is one of the sheep of Israel. And the Pharisees are the supposed shepherds at the time. But Jesus is talking in the context of Ezekiel chapter 34 and verses 11 to 31, which brings out plainly that God himself is the shepherd of Israel. He is the good shepherd. And it talks about God himself sending a descendant of David to shepherd his flock. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 11, it says, For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day that he is among the sheep. So I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they are scattered on the cloudy and dark day. Now, for this blind man, when he was cast out or excommunicated from the synagogue, that was a cloudy and a dark day for him. He probably didn't know what he was going to do in order to provide for himself. And Jesus is bringing out that he is the good shepherd that is seeking out this lost sheep whom the other shepherds have neglected. Verse 16, he says, I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and strong and feed them in the judgment. So Jesus is bringing out the Pharisees presenting themselves as the shepherds of the flock are actually the shepherds that are spoken about in Ezekiel 34 that are the bad shepherds. They're the ones who don't care for the flock. Now the Pharisees understand this comparison. And they understand that Jesus' claim to be the good shepherd is his claim to be God. And if they accept the fact that Jesus 
who had healed this blind man, who had been born blind, was blind all his life, that Jesus, like that, could heal him, they would have to accept the fact that Jesus was more than just an ordinary man. The other bookend in that Gospel of John is John chapter 11, where Jesus calls forth Lazarus out of the grave, who's been dead for four days. And at that point, there's no denying that Jesus, claiming to be the good shepherd, has shown himself to be that good shepherd. A few weeks ago, we went on a trip to Berrien Springs, and along the way we listened to a story put out by a group called YWAM. It was about a man named Jacob de Shazer. Jacob was uh, born in a poor family, and he was not a very religious person for most of his life. And there was an early story that stuck in his mind in coming to church. They were a very poor family, and at one point his mother had saved up enough money to buy he and his brother a pair of bib overhauls. And when he went to church, he went to his Sunday school, so proud of his bib overhauls, and at the end of the class, the Sunday school teacher called him aside and he said, uh, Jacob, when you go home, could you tell your mother not to send you in bib overhauls anymore? Jacob had not much of a concern or a desire for religion after that experience. His mother was a Christian, and she was a praying woman who prayed for Jacob in his life. Jacob, as he grew up, enlisted in the Army Air Corps, got assigned to a, a bombing squadron, and he was doing KP duty, kitchen police. Well, he was peeling potatoes and he was listening to the radio. And this was December 7, 1941. And all of a sudden he hears news about an attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese destroying the U.S. fleet in the area of Pearl Harbor. And Jacob, as he was peeling his potatoes, he turned and he said, they have to pay for this. Short time after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Jacob joined a group of people in a secret mission. And he didn't know what the mission was, but they had brought together about 25 different crews for bombers, B-25 bombers, that were airplanes used in the war at that time. And they went to Florida to do some training. And the training was very strange. These airplanes had been modified to be able to carry a lot more gas than normal, so they have some of the uh, things inside the airplane were removed so they could put more fuel in there. And these men, over their time, they were practicing low-level flying over water, and they were practicing uh, landing and taking off in a place that was maybe half the length of what the bomber would normally take off. And they practiced this and they practiced this. They thought it was a, a very strange to be having to practice that kind of a maneuver. When they were finally told what their secret mission was, there was uh, a war hero named Jimmy Doolittle. And he was going to be leading a bombing attack on Japan, which from their present standards would seem almost impossible because of the range that these bombers would have to fly. They were taking the bombers on an aircraft carrier and they were going to have them take off from that aircraft carrier where they had only about 500 feet 
of runway to take off. So all of their practice of getting into the air as quickly as possible was so that they could take off from the aircraft carrier. And they were being taken across the sea as close as they could get to Japan before they would launch the airplanes because they had a limited supply of fuel and they had to make it to their bombing targets. And then after they bombed Japan, they would have to fly inland on China until they got to the area that was favorable to the Americans. There was a portion of China that was in Japanese control. So they had to make it beyond that point and land in safety. Jacob was in an airplane, it was the last one to take off, and as part of the uh, hectic maneuvering when they were taking off, his airplane actually banged into the back of another of the airplanes, and it broke out a section of the glass near the front of the airplane, which caused them to have to fly a little bit slower, and it also caused them to use more fuel than the other airplanes. They got to their bombing target. They bombed Nagoya, Japan. And then they tried to continue on to safety, but the hole in the airplane was a major impediment. And they got to a place where they realized that the airplane was going to be going down and that they would need to bail out. So the crew abandoned their airplane. They parachuted into the what turned out to be enemy territory. Jacob's mother was later told when she heard about the raid, he was in the raid, but he was lost and presumed dead. And Jacob's mother was a praying mother. And she said, I know my little Jake is out there somewhere and I'm not gonna stop praying till I see him again. He was taken to Tokyo, he was taken to a, a series of POW camps, and for the next 40 months, he spent 34 months in solitary confinement. And he went through a variety of different experiences with various types of torture, uh, very little food. They would give them a, a very watered down small cup of soup with a piece of bread each day, that was their food for some time. At a later time, they had a bowl of what looked like rice pushed under the door, but it turned out that it was crawling with maggots. They, they were doing anything they could do to break the men. Jacob was beaten, he was malnourished. Three of the other crew were killed by a firing squad, another one died of starvation. Now, toward the end of the war, the emperor, Japanese emperor Hirohito, actually commuted uh, the sentence for de Chaser. He had a death sentence upon him, but they actually changed it to life imprisonment. And as the war came to an end, he and the other prisoners in the camp in Beijing, China, were finally released when the American soldiers parachuted into the camp. There were 16 airplanes with five people on each of the airplanes. So they had 60, or they had 80 of the Doolittle Raiders that made it to Japan. And out of that group, 64 of them made it back safely without a problem. Of the remaining 16, some of them were killed in their effort to make it to safety. Some of them were executed by the enemy. And what would seem even worse, some of them were taken POWs. And they experienced the torture throughout the camp. One of the things that they had done just to make life miserable for the prisoners. They had a small stool for them 
where they sat near the floor, cramped with their legs, and their job was to look at the wall for 16 hours a day. And if they got off of the stool for any reason, they were beaten and prodded with swords until they got back on. And Jacob had done that for some time, and finally he was getting to the point that he felt life wasn't worth living anyway. And he got off of his stool, and he knelt down on the ground, and he started to pray. We're going to find out a little bit more about that later. But the question, when you see 80 of the people went, 64 came back with no problem. 16 endured all kinds of problems, even to the point of death. And the question is, why? Why did some of the group end up having to endure all of what they endured, and the other ones seemed to go along with no problem? Sometimes it's hard to understand why things happen. On his return to the United States, Jacob de Chaser was given the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Purple Heart for his part in the raid on Japan. Now, the interesting thing, during his time in the prison, one of the guards had given the prisoners five books to read to fill their time. And one of these books happened to be a Bible. Most people back home thought Jake was dead, his mother was praying, believing that he was out there somewhere in the darkness. The men decided to take three weeks each with the Bible. Jacob took day and night those three weeks to pour over the Bible to find the message of God's forgiveness. And as he started understanding the message about God and him sending his son into the world, Jacob himself realized that he was being spared, that his own life was spared when others had perished. And Jacob decided at that point he was going to become a devout Christian. He chose to accept Jesus into his life. And his conversion included using a few words of Japanese that he had learned. And he decided to start treating his captives with respect. One morning when the guard came into his cell, and it was the same harsh treatment, poking and prodding and making him sit on this little stool. But when the guard came in, Jacob very cheerfully told him good morning in Japanese. Somehow it made a difference with the guard. Later on, he came in and he gave Jacob a sweet potato, which was the first good food that he had had in a very, very long time. And Jacob decided in his mind that he was going to do something when he got out of captivity. And it was something amazing. He decided that when he made it out to freedom, that he was going to come back to Japan as a missionary to share the love of Jesus with the Japanese people. After his release, he entered Seattle Pacific College, which was a Methodist uh, denomination college. He began studying to be a missionary. And eventually, he returned to Japan with his wife, Florence as they were missionaries for the next 30 years to his enemies. The amazing part of the story is that he met a man named Mitsuo Fuchida, who was the man who had organized the attack on Pearl Harbor. And Captain Fuchida had become a Christian after reading a tract that was written about Jacob de Chaser telling about how he was a prisoner in Japan and telling about the change in his life 
that he was a different man and that he was coming back to share about the peace and the love of Jesus. At times, Captain Fuchida and Jake would share as missionaries as they traveled through Japan because they were now Christian brothers. A man who had led the bombing attack on Pearl Harbor and a man who had been a part of the bombing attack on Japan. And now they're Christian brothers and they were sharing about the love of Jesus. It was a very important thing for them to be able to share in Japan because at that time the religious mindset was that the emperor was divine. It was very much like in the old uh, Roman Empire. And the fact that the emperor had actually succumbed and lost a war was very humiliating and shattering to their whole religious framework. So there was a religious vacuum that was filled by many, many missionaries going over to Japan to share the love of Jesus with the people there. In the book Ministry of Healing, page 472, there's a quote that I love. It says, in the full light of day and in hearing of the music of other voices, a caged bird will not sing the song that his master seeks to teach him. He learns a snatch of this or a trill of that, but never a separate and entire melody. But the master covers the cage and places it where the bird will listen to the one song he is to sing. And in the dark he tries and he tries again to sing that song until it's finally learned. And he breaks forth in perfect melody. Then the bird is brought forth and ever after he can sing that song in the light. Thus God deals with his children. He has a song to teach us, and when we've learned it amid the shadows of affliction, we can sing it forever afterward. Amen. Jacob de Chaser learned a song about the grace and forgiveness of a God who gave his only son to save a world that had gone astray from him. It was a song about a God who had spared his own life, and taught him to forgive his enemies. Amen. Jacob learned his song in the darkness of that POW camp. And he was able to share the message with his enemy for the rest of his life on earth. But there's something more. Throughout the countless ages of eternity, Jacob de Chaser will be recounting the matchless love of the Savior who carried him through all of the suffering and grief, preserved his life and changed his heart, Amen. and gave him the mission to reveal the matchless love of Jesus Amen. to men and to angels. John chapter 9 and verse 3, if you think of our scripture reading, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned in order that this should come upon him, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Why should Enoch be translated to heaven? Why should Elijah ride in a fiery chariot up to heaven while John the Baptist is dying in a lonely prison while well, he's decapitated by an angry king. Desire of Ages, page 225, there's a beautiful quote. It said, God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose they're fulfilling as co-workers with him. Now, I would be willing to say that I think when we get into the kingdom, I don't think Jacob de Chaser would ever say, I wish I didn't have that experience. I think he's going to realize what Jesus did with that experience 
And he's going to be sharing forever about the glory of this God who can take the most rotten things in our lives and bring something good. Amen. I'd like to finish up in uh, Psalm 23, if you turn over there. When we think about the good shepherd, Jesus talking about himself being the good shepherd. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, for he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now why does the good shepherd lead some of his children over torturous, unexplainable paths of heartache while others seem to be going on with what seems like no concern at all? We turn to John 9, 3. It's not through any sin or fault of their own, but God in his infinite wisdom has chosen in the darkness and the sorrow and the pain to reveal a part of himself through the life of that person who will simply trust him in spite of not knowing why or where he's leading them, and that person who will eventually come forth to forever sing a powerful song of glory to the Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite Carrie and Daniel and Juan and Elisa to come forward and share our closing song and I'd like you to listen very carefully to the words of this song. In shady green pasture, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley in darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through children along through grace we can conquer defeat all our foes god leads his dear children along 
Some through the waters. Some through the flood. Some through the fire. But all through the blood. Some through great sorrow. But God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Some through great sorrow. But God gives a song. Some through the waters, and some through the flood. Some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season, and all the day long. Friends, I don't know where you are in your journey today, but I want to assure you that as you walk even through the valley of the shadow of death, that the Good Shepherd is by your side. As you learn the song that he's giving you to sing for his eternal glory. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much that even in the, the worst of life, that you are by our side and that you are leading us and that you are teaching a song that no one else will be able to sing. When we get to your kingdom, Lord, it will be a song to your glory. As we gather on a morning like this, I realize that there may be someone here who doesn't even know the Good Shepherd yet. And I invite you at this moment that if you have not committed your life to Jesus as the Good Shepherd, that you would open your heart to him this morning, just in the quiet as we pray, that you would just say, Jesus, come in, I need you to lead me in my life. I know there are some that are striving to follow at this time, but they just don't understand why they're going through the experiences that they're going through. And Father, I ask that you would give them a sense of your presence close to them, as you teach them the life song that you have for them. And Lord, I know that there may be some parents here or aunts and uncles who, like Jacob's mother, know that their child is out there lost in the darkness somewhere. And they're not going to give up praying until they see him come home. Father, I pray for these people as well, that you would give them the blessed experience that Jacob's mother had when he returned home and became a missionary that will be seated very close to Jesus' throne in his kingdom. A blessing for a Christian mother who would not give up praying for that son who had no interest in Jesus. Lord, what an amazing God you are. Go with us today. Change our lives and work out that story, that song that you have for each of us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.